The government of Venezuela reported that it sees a new legal shipment of arms from the United States. The Ecuadorian President Daniel Novoa presents a project of partial reform in the National Assembly to allow the establishment of foreign military bases in the country. And in the last 24 hours alone, Israel has committed three massacres in the Gaza Strip, killing 26 people and injuring 84. Hello, welcome to From the South. I'm Luis Alberto Matos from the Desu Studios in Havana, Cuba. We begin with the news. During the podcast Con Maduro Mas, the government of Venezuela reported that it seized a new illegal shipment of arms from the United States. During a dialogue between the Minister of Interior, Desdado Cabello, and the Venezuelan Head of State, Nicolás Maduro, he informed that on Monday, a new seizure of U.S. armament was made in the country, which was introduced by the CIA prior to the elections held on July 28th. In this regard, President Maduro blamed the CIA for including fugitives from Venezuelan justice in destabilizing acts against the country. Today, I was informing the president, all these weapons come from the United States, all of them. Today, thanks to the intelligence work, at this moment before the program, right president, before the program, in a place in Venezuela, we made a new seizure of weapons. It is in full swing. It is in full development. At this time that you see me, the intelligence and protection security forces are acting so that peace and tranquility continue to reign in Venezuela. Because Madeleine asks and I answer. What would have happened? We would have fought. We would have triumphed. And perhaps they would not have been arrested. Maybe they would have been killed by the patriotic fire of the Bolivarian National Armed Forces, the Bolivarian National Police, the Bolivarian National Intelligence Service, the Military Counterintelligence General Directorate, because Venezuela has military police and security forces to defend it. It has people to defend it. That is what they cannot understand. The Venezuelan head of state also explained that the CIA's armament is the official weapon of the Navy SEALs, for which he blamed the CIA for introducing it into the country to perpetrate terrorist actions. This rifle that is here is an assault rifle, high level. This tip here is to put an air suppressor, which is a silencer. It has a telescopic sight, medium range. It is a natural rifle built for the United States military forces, for the ex exclusive use of the United States military forces. It is forbidden to be traded and sold because it is for the exclusive use of the United States military forces. Like this one, we have several rifles exporter and here is the caliber 762 by 39 and here's the serial number i reserve the serial number the united states government knows that we have this rifle and other armament which was introduced by the cia to venezuela for terrorist attacks requested by fascism in venezuela you can see here restricted government of the united states and it is important, Mr. President, that it be known that this is the official weapon of the Navy SEALs. It is the official weapon of the Navy SEALs, not of the commandos. And it is precisely Mr. Castañeda, an active U.S. military officer who is in charge of this operation. In this sense, the Venezuelan president pointed out that the U.S. government is clearly violating international law and specifically the founding charter of the United Nations for its criminal actions against Venezuela. Because all these sectors that call for violence, for civil war, for invasion, for assassination in Venezuela are protected in territory of the United States which clearly violates international law and especially violates the founding charter of the United Nations. At this moment, the government is 
of the United States is openly violating the Charter of the United Nations for its actions of instigating violence in Venezuela. In Colombia, through an agreement between the Reparation Fund of the Victims Unit and the National Land Agency, victims of parliamentarism will receive 18,000 hectares to repair the damage they have suffered. According to Lydia Solano, director of the Victims Unit, and Felipe Hartmann, director of the National Land Agency, the FRV will receive an amount of more than $175 billion, which will make possible distribution of the victims' resources in the purchase of the land destined to repair the community. For his part, Felipe Hartmann pointed out that this is the first time that the agency makes a massive purchase from the FRV and that it, this is thanks to the political will of both administrations to break down the institutional barriers that prevented the implementation of the agreement. And more than 100 indigenous leaders gather in the town of Curare in the Chilean mountain range to discuss in what serves as the first international congress of indigenous conservation territories. Indigenous leaders from territories such as the Arawak of Sierra Nevada in Colombia, the Shuar of the Ecuadorian Amazon, the Huachipedi of Peru, the Aymara of the Andean Highlands, as well as representatives from different territories of the Mapuche people, met to discuss common solutions to share problems. The congress also focused on community life, fundamental characteristic of indigenous peoples undermined by extractivist capitalism. And in Argentina, thousands of students marched on Monday during the anniversary of 48 of La Noche de los Lapices, in English, the Night of the Pencils. The mobilization this Monday was attended by young people, human rights organizations, and political entities, honoring the victims of the Night of the Pencils, a group of students kidnapped on September 16, 1976, by police and army officers in Buenos Aires. The demonstration took place after the head of state introduced a budget bill to cut the 2025 investment in science, technology, and education. Protesters demanded the president not to veto the education funding bill. Likewise, they claimed for the continuity of the memory policies. Let's now take a short break, but remember you can join us on TikTok at Telesur English, where you'll find news in different formats, news updates, and much more. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Welcome back. The President of Ecuador, Daniel Loboa, will present a project of partial reform to the Constitution in the National Assembly for the lifting of the ban on foreign military bases in the country, a fact that has been questioned by citizens. The Ecuadorian President announced that the project has the presumed objective of modifying Article 5 of the Constitution, which prohibits the establishment of foreign military bases in the country, in order to allow the military settlement of the United States. For this part, the Ecuadorian people have rejected this project, questioning the concept of sovereignty of President Noboa by recognizing that he is incapable of controlling the situation that the country is going through, thus granting authority to the United States to exercise security rights in Ecuadorian territory. In his account on X, the president published a statement where he said, under the pretext of fighting crime, the presidential proposal will eliminate the ban on the establishment of foreign military bases or foreign facilities for military purposes, as well as eliminate the ban on sending national military bases to foreign armed forces or security forces. The text states that time has shown that all decisions have only weakened the country in the face of threats that today know no borders. From the government, we are very clear about the country we want. It is time for the National Assembly to decide which side of history it will be on. In our news, the explosion of a tanker truck on South Day in Haiti reaches a toll of 28 deaths. The event occurred about 100 kilometers south of the capital when a tanker hit another truck on the road. Despite warnings from the driver not to get too close, locals started to take fuel, and immediately after the explosion took place, the Director General of Civil Protection, Emmanuel Pierre, has indicated that there are also 42 wounded, according to the latest reports of the tragedy. Moreover, the Minister of Public Health, George Fields, 
expressed during a press conference on Monday his condolences to the families of the victims. Fields say that between Saturday and Sunday, 30 victims were evacuated from NIPS to Port-au-Prince, and all departments of the Ministry of Health were mobilized to provide support. In the Brazilian Midwest, the worst drought in decades is exacerbating a forest fire crisis. The correspondent Brian Mir has more. During the last six weeks, man-made forest fires caused by agribusiness actors clearing land for cattle pasture have raged across Brazil. To make things worse, in many of the hardest hit areas, it hasn't rained for months, facilitating the spread of the fires. In the national capital of Brasilia, it hasn't rained for 150 days, representing its worst drought in 44 years. There are regular droughts during this time of the year in Midwestern Brazil, but this year it is much worse than normal, not just here, but across the whole country, and this is connected to deepening climate change and changes in land use, which is mainly connected to an expansion of agribusiness. According to data from Mapa Biomas, agribusiness is responsibly for 97% of the destruction of native vegetation in Brazil during the last five years. Brazil is one of the world's largest producers of two interrelated commodities that require huge amounts of water, beef and soy, which is mainly used to feed cattle. Production of both commodities is causing massive deforestation in the Amazon rainforest and in the Midwest, a region of tropical savanna with unique flora and fauna which is rapidly disappearing due to consumers in the U.S., China and Europe's taste for Brazilian beef. This historic drought is the culmination of many years of the destruction of over half of the vegetation in this fantastic biome of the Cerrado. So, now we see that the start of the rainy season takes place over 30 days later than it used to. The average temperature has risen by over 1.5 degrees Celsius in the region. An annual rainfall has dropped by 8%. We see that these are primarily the effects of the conversion of native vegetation by agribusiness. On Sunday, September 15th, a huge forest fire started in Brasilia National Park in the middle of the federal district. Brian Mir, tell us, sir. Brasilia. The rainy season in Guatemala has left 28 people dead and just over 26,000 people evacuated since May. The National Coordination for Disaster Reduction detailed that in addition to the 28 fatalities of the rain, 13 people were injured, no missing so far. The greatest number of deaths from rainfall is in the province of Suchitepeques, with four in total, followed by the Department of San Marcos. Both are located in the southwest of the Central American country. According to the same source, 26,240 people have been evacuated due to rain damage since May, and 9,327 are currently at risk. And Storm Boris, which hit Central and Eastern Europe in recent days, left at least 15 people dead, thousands of people evacuated, entire regions flooded, power and drinking water supplies cut, and transportation networks disrupted. According to data presented, since on Monday since Friday, there has been incessant rainfall that caused rivers to swell to usual levels for this time of the year, exceeding the water reserve capacity in several regions. In addition, the regional and national governments of the affected countries declared states of natural disaster in order to be able to release financial aid to those affected and spend what is necessary to restore electricity, drinking water, and essential transportation. We have a second short break coming up, but before we invite you to visit our YouTube channel at Telesur English, there you'll be able to rewatch our interviews, top stories, special broadcastings, and more. Hit the subscribe button and activate the notification bell to stay up to date on the world's most recent events. Found your break and go away.
Welcome back. In Palestine, authorities denounced that in the last 24 hours alone, Israel has committed three massacres in the Gaza Strip, killing 26 people and injuring 84. At least four people, including a child, were killed by shelling by the occupation army on Tuesday morning on homes in the Burej refugee camp, while some 30 civilians were left buried under the rubble. According to civil defense rescue teams, it was a two-fold attack that struck firstly on a block of houses and secondly on emergency teams searching through the rubble. The death of the genocide launched by Israel on October 7th has increased to more than 41,000 victims, most of them children and women, while more than 95,000 Palestinians have been wounded. Palestinian aid groups say Israel is preventing 83% of food aid from reaching Gaza. A group of 15 aid organizations declared in a joint statement that the people of Gaza are only eating an average of one meal a day because the Israeli military is blocking 83% of the food needed to reach the besieged enclave. They, they added that the amount of aid blocked by Israel has increased substantially since 2023, when only 34% of food aid was blocked. Director of the Palestinian NGO network, Amshad al Shawa, said in the statement that 100% of Gaza's population is now dependent on aid and the shortages mean that people are starving. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres condemned Israel's collective punishment of the Palestinian people in Gaza. Well, it is unimaginable. The level of suffering in Gaza, the level of death and destruction, have no parallel in everything I've witnessed since I am Secretary General. Obviously, uh, we all condemn the terror attacks made by Hamas, um, uh, as well as the taking of hostages, that is an absolute violation of international humanitarian law. But the truth is that nothing justifies the collective punishment of the Palestinian people. And that is what we are witnessing in a dramatic way in Gaza. In turn, UN Special Rapporteur on the Right Situation in the Occupied Palestinian Territory, Francesca Albanese, said that Israel has become a pariah and suggested that the country's membership in the UN should be questioned. It's avoidable for Israel to become a pariah in the face of its continuous, relentless, vilifying assault on the United Nations on top of uh, Palestine, millions of Palestinians. Um, but this year, the UN Secretary General, the General Assembly, the Human Rights Council have been constantly vilified. Not that it has not happened before, but never with this intensity. Yemeni Armed Forces spokesman Lieutenant General Yahya Sari reported on Monday that the country's air defense shot down a U.S. MQ 9 Reaper drone with a surface to air missile while conducting spying operations over Damar province. This is the 10th drone of this type shot down by Yemen in support of Palestinians in Gaza who have been suffering a brutal aggression from the Zionist regime since October. The note also highlights that it is the third MQ-9 drone that has been intercepted and destroyed by in Yemeni airspace this week. The MQ-9 Reaper drone is an advanced U.S. Army drone valued at more than 30 million U.S. dollars. Meanwhile, in the United States, former President Donald Trump was unharmed after an apparent assassination attempt on Sunday in West Palm Beach, Florida, while playing on a golf course near his private club. Ryan Wesley Ralph, a 58-year-old man, was arrested after being discovered with a rifle near the course. Ralph had been camping in the area for more than 12 hours before he was identified by the Secret Service. Floyd is noted that despite being armed and concealed in nearby vegetation, Ralph did not have a direct line of sight to Trump at the time of the incident. Secret Service agents detected the weapon and fire at the suspect, who was captured shortly thereafter in a neighboring county. And the Meta Corporation announced on Monday the blocking on these platforms of Russia Today and other related entities. According to the statement, Russia Today and other related entities are now banned on apps such as Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, and threads alleging foreign interference activity. Previously, Washington had accused Russia today of supposed connections to Russian intelligence services. Special representative of the U.S. State Department, James Rubin, indicated that the new sanctions against Russia today will be the toughest possible. For her part, the spokeswoman of the Russian Foreign Ministry, Maria Zakharova, denounced that Russian journalists have been the object of real terrorist information attacks by the United States.
Now, Russian authorities pointed out that the coercive measures imposed by Congress led to an increase in the volume of business with the countries of the BRICS group. This was reported by the Director of the Trade Negotiations Department of the Ministry of Economic and Development of Russia, Ekaterina Mayrova. In an interview with Sputnik News Agency, the official explained that sanctions against Russia as a result of the military operation in Ukraine have led to restrictions in trade with the Western bloc countries. On the other hand, the data showed the increase of trade relations with the BRICS country. This alliance accounts for almost half the world's population, 40% of the global oil production, and about 25% of exports of goods. We have come to the end of this news brief. You can find these and many other stories on our website, TerrestrialEnglish.net. Also join us on social media, Facebook, X, Instagram, Telegram, and TikTok. For Terrestrial English, I'm Luis Alberto Matos. Thanks for watching.